This week on Under the Radar, I'll be drilling down further on that societal cancer that is postmodernism. Now, recently I've been talking a lot about postmodernism and its illegitimate children, such as gender studies and intersectionality. And I will continue to do so because I think it represents a huge threat to Enlightenment values and ultimately Western civilization. So firstly, I'm going to rehash some of the points I made in recent videos and then look at some more recent examples to illustrate these points. So in promoting mediocrity, I included this clip of Camille Paglia criticizing the type of people that are attracted to women's or gender studies. One of the problems was that, that, that really, really smart and talented people did not go into women's studies. Exactly. Okay? So they, were, they, were all, they, were, they were second and third graders right from the start. Okay? Yeah. There are people looking for a dogma. Okay? It attracts people looking for a dogma, as opposed to open-minded inquiry, following the evidence wherever it may lead in the pursuit of truth, free of agendas and dogmas, which of course requires more work, more critical thought, a tolerance of complexity and nuance, which leads me to the second point I made about intersectionality that I quoted from a Quillette article in reference to protesters at a panel discussion at Rutgers University. One of the things that struck me over and over was the protesters' complete intolerance of complexity. Despite intersectionality's roots in academic theory, the politics of the intersectional left are deeply anti-intellectual. It's not just that many intersectional activists seem to have no capacity for nuance, they fear and hate it because they hate anything with the potential to complicate their narrative. Things are right or wrong. You're with us or against us. Human beings, rather than complex agents with independent motivations and intellects, are nothing more than the sum total of their identities. Get on the bus or get under it. And so people like Milo, a gay conservative, is too much complexity for the simple-minded intersectionalist. And so on to recent events. You may remember the attention-seeking Drexel University professor that tweeted out on Christmas Eve last year that all he wanted for Christmas was white genocide. This he claimed was meant to satirize the concept of white genocide, which he said is a figment of the racist imagination. It should be mocked, and I'm glad to have mocked it. Well, fair enough. But since then, he seems to have a case of relevance deprivation syndrome, and so has tweeted out all kinds of controversial statements. One back in March suggested he was sickened by the fact a passenger in first class gave up his seat for a soldier. And more recently, he's doubling down on the anti-whiteness rhetoric, claiming that the Las Vegas shooting should be blamed on the entitlement of white men. White people and men are told that they're entitled to everything. This is what happens when they don't get what they want. Which is kind of strange, given that that shooter, from all reports, had done quite well for himself in his life. Anyway, this earned him a suspension from Drexel University, not because of his comments, but because of concerns over his safety. Apparently, and not for the first time, he's received death threats. Now, clearly, if you make death threats over this guy's comments, then you're no better than an SJW complaining that free speech is hate speech, and therefore they get to punch you because you're a Nazi. And now the good professor claims that whiteness was the cause of the Texas church shooting, repeating the line of white male entitlement and lashing out when it doesn't get what it wants. Now, it's not my intention to go through the motivations for any of those shootings, but I would like to point out that of the 91 mass shootings in the US since 1982, three of which the perpetrator was unknown, 51 or 58 percent were white, which is a little less than the proportion of US citizens that are white. So Chicarello's explanation doesn't even pass the most basic statistical analysis. But to return to the point, Chicarello is an example of someone that can't handle complexity and seeks refuge in a dogma that provides the same answer to all questions. Forget about all the possible motivations for mass shootings. It can all be boiled down to white supremacy and white male entitlement. Think about the first part of his statement with respect to Las Vegas. White people and men are told that they're entitled to everything. Now, I'm sure many of you, like me, were brought up with the exact opposite view of the world, that you aren't entitled to anything, that you have to work and work hard for what you want in life. But again, a mind like Chicarello's reaches for a simplistic explanation that purports to explain everything, but on closer examination, explains practically nothing. Jordan Peterson summed it up well in a recent interview. Doctor, good morning to you. Thanks morning. for having a couch call today. You bet. What do you make of this uh, Drexel professor who's been in and out of the news so often, and now he's uh, blaming that 
for the cause of the shooting in Texas. I think he's applying his ideological formula to a very complex problem. And it's an easy thing to do. It's this sort of postmodern formula that's taught to university students everywhere now. What is the formula? Attribute everything to racial disparity and oppression, victimization. Just everything? Well, essentially, it's a recasting of Marxism, I would say. And it, with the Marxist theory, it was rich against poor, bourgeoisie against proletariat. And that was recast in the 1970s as oppression due to group identity, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so that's where identity politics came from. It's a formula you can learn in about a day. And then you can use it to explain everything. Mm -hmm. College is designed to teach you to think about the world and prepare you for the world outside of college. How is this helping that? And what kind of students are we getting when they're 22, 23, whenever they graduate? You have the tense wrong. College was that. Understood. So, and, and I don't think it is that in many cases now, especially, especially in the liberal arts. And that's a real catastrophe. Much different than my experience 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, well, things have changed dramatically in the last five years, I would say. And we saw this rise of political correctness in the 1990s. It burst forward in between 1990 and about 1993. And then it seemed to subside a little bit, but it's back with an absolute vengeance now. And we know that most of the university campuses, uh, in the liberal arts anyways, are heavily dominated by leftist thinking, and radical leftist thinking for that matter. Well, what happened, so, Doctor, in the early 90s to uh, spawn this? Well, I, I think it's popped up more or less repeatedly since the late 1960s. Um, I'm not sure exactly why Started it with the anti-war movement? Yeah, and, yeah, with the anti-war movement, that, but there was, a, there was a fair bit of radical thinking in the 1960s on the, on the left side, and many of those people ended up teaching in universities. And so and with, uh, with the rise of postmodernism, that, that's a huge factor. That was a French intellectual school that was a, a transformation of Marxism into identity politics, essentially. Mm -hmm. And because it's, I think in some sense, because it requires almost no intellectual effort and leaves you with an overwhelming sense of moral superiority, it's very attractive to people. Mm -hmm. They're basically teaching young people, I would say, to be ideological avatars, to go act out this this pernicious doctrine in the in the well, real world. I want to ask you this because I live in a very democratic state, Connecticut, right? Yep. None of my friends would ever operate like this. Now, granted, my friends are older. They find this reprehensible. So, so I mean, it seems like a lot of Democrats are fired up about this idiocy. Oh, yeah. Well, lots of people who are in what you might describe as the liberal center are very unhappy that the political landscape on the left side has shifted way over to the radical radical leftist side. That's a very common sentiment now. And I think it's happening faster than people really understand. So we have, you, it's almost impossible to overstate how influential these postmodern doctrines have become and how they're seeping in now into corporations, mostly through HR departments. Right. Note what Peterson said about postmodernism seeping into corporations. There's no better example of that than James Damore. Damore dared to challenge the simplistic notion of gender stereotypes to explain why there are fewer women than men in tech by suggesting that there are other factors at play like well-established biological sex differences. But this was too much complexity for the dogmatists, and so Damore had to be fired for his heresy. Unfortunately, as Peterson said, much of the humanities and liberal arts are now infected with the postmodernist virus, churning out ideological avatars to do the bidding of the George Chicolaros of the world. And of course, Peterson himself has been identified as a heretic by these same ideologues. Thought police strike again as Wilfred Laurier, grad student, is chastised for showing Jordan Peterson video. Her supervising professor told her that by showing the video to her Canadian Communication in Context class, it basically was like neutrally playing a speech by Hitler. Oh, Jesus! Lindsay Shepard, a 22-year-old graduate student at the school in Waterloo, Ontario, was informed that merely by showing the clip taken from a televised debate between Peterson and Nicholas Matty, a lecturer at the U of T Sexual Diversity Studies program, she was legitimising Peterson's views about genderless pronouns. She's been told she must now submit her lesson plans to her supervisor in advance, that he may sit in on her next few classes, and that she must not show any more controversial videos of this kind. Shepard was this week hauled into a meeting with Ram Bukhana, that's her supervising professor, program coordinator Herbert Pilmet and Adria Joel, acting manager of the Gendered Violence Prevention and Support Program. 
She was told that after she showed the five minute video clip, one student, many students, the group refused to say how many students were unhappy because that information is deemed confidential, complained that she had created a toxic climate. Spunkily, she asked if she was supposed to shelter students from controversial ideas. Am I supposed to comfort them? She asked at one point, bewildered, and said it was antithetical to the spirit of a university. Rambukana then informed her that since Bill C-16 was passed, even making such arguments runs counter to the law. So I'd say that pretty much vindicates the concerns Peterson had about the law and how it would be used. In the 35-minute meeting where she was outnumbered 3-1, to one, Shepard vigorously defended herself, explaining she had been scrupulously even-handed and not taken a position herself or endorsed Peterson's remarks before showing the video, and that a student seemed engaged by it and it expressed a wide range of opinions. Now, this is the best part. But what was part of the problem she was told by presenting the matter neutrally and not condemning Peterson's views as problematic or worse, she was cultivating a space where those opinions can be nurtured. Wow! Oh no, someone might actually form an opinion that is not prescribed by the faculty. We can't have that, can we? Another one of the three remarked, everyone is entitled to their opinions, but the university has a duty to make sure we're not furthering Jordan Peterson. As the author of this piece noted, they were oblivious to the fact that they themselves were proving him right by holding the 2017 equivalent of the struggle sessions so beloved in Mao's China. Shepard is now sufficiently disillusioned, she told Post Media Friday, that she's about 70% sure I will be leaving Wilfred Laurier after this semester is over. So is it time to hunker down in our survivalist bunkers and wait for the postmodern apocalypse to devour itself? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I'll see you next time. <laughs>